I love the heart of King David. King David had the opportunity to buy a piece of land where the Ark of the Covenant and worship would soon be established. And when the landowner heard of this price, we see in scripture that he wanted to give it at a discount. And David, who was the king of Israel, his response was this, I wanna pay full price because I do not want to give my God an offering that doesn't cost me something. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? I guess it's just me and you, Aaron. That's pretty incredible, right? The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And so tonight as we receive our offering, let's be mindful that it's not the amount that you give but rather it is the heart behind your giving. And so tonight, when I think about Holy Week, when I think about the price that Jesus paid, I can't help but to look at my own life and ask myself in prayer, what can you do this week? What can you do this week that would be a sacrifice, that would bring honor and glory to God and maybe it's maybe for you it's you can give your time this week a sacrifice of your time maybe this week uh, it's a sacrifice of praise maybe you'll just take some time off and you'll get alone with God and you'll give him the praise that he's worthy of maybe it is a sacrifice of maybe a gift you have or maybe it's even a financial sacrifice but I want to encourage you uh, this holy week I want to encourage you to be prayerful and mindful about what you can do through giving, through, through the spirit of sacrifice that would bring honor and glory to Jesus. Lord Jesus, this week is set apart. Our brothers and sisters around the world, Lord, are honoring you. And Lord, as we consider Lord, what we can do, Lord, it pales in comparison to what you've already done. And so we give in response to what you have already given. So Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and that you would give us, Lord, specific, Lord, specific instructions around our giving this week. For some of us, Lord, you're gonna ask us to give some time maybe we don't have to serve someone, Lord, that you're placing in our heart. For some of us, Lord, you're going, Lord, you're going to cause us, Lord, to use our talents and abilities, Lord, to honor and glorify you. And for some, Lord God, for some of us, you're inviting us to give financially, Lord, sacrificially, as we consider, Lord Jesus, who you are and all that you have given, Lord, to us. We ask that you receive this offering tonight in the mighty, matchless name, your name, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen Amen. and amen. 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 We're so excited tonight. We have, we have somewhere close to 50 people that are going to be water baptized tonight. Isn't that incredible? And uh, we're so excited. Um, I do want to let everyone know that um, my favorite preacher is preaching tonight. Last fall, uh, we scheduled a guest speaker for tonight. And about a week ago, we got a call and it didn't work out. We were so far in advance that we completely missed, uh, we completely missed the reality that this was Holy Week. And this, our guest pastors, an incredible church, but also this happened to be his birthday. 
so if you're here tonight and, and you're looking uh, for that guest to speak, um, he's not here. But there is one better who's going to bring the word tonight. And I'm excited. I'm excited. And uh, for most of you, right, most of you are here, you don't know. I'm not going to say his name. Um, dear, we're dear friends, um, and he will be coming soon. So like the Lord, no man knows the day or the hour. <laughs> but he's going to come. But listen, um, I do want to say this uh, to you before I introduce my wife tonight. And uh, that is, is that um, we really do co-pastor this church. And I think it's important, I've said this a lot in the past, but I think it's important for everyone to know that Pastor Allie Muncie is not a pastor because she's my wife. Uh, pastor Allie Muncie um, went to Bible college on her own before me. She got better grades than me. And she has her own legacy of ministry. Um, on her mother's side of the family, her grandmother was the very first female preacher in their denomination. Her grandfather, pa Pastor Owen Shackett, pastored the People Church, which was the largest church in the Northwest for many years. And uh, I am so proud to co-pastor this church with my wife, and I have to tell you, not only does she make better grades than me in Bible college, not only is she a better Christian than me, I think she's even a better preacher than me. And I'm, and I'm not saying that like for, oh, you're good too. I really mean it. And uh, I'm more of a teacher, right? She's a preacher. But, but I just want to say to you, Allie, I, I, I always t take a moment to honor the guests, but I just want to say thank you for being on this journey with me uh, as a co-pastor and a co-leader. And can you believe these last 15 years what God has done? Can you believe that your middle son is taller than me? <laughs> and he's on the front row and he's taking notes and your other two sons are in ministry and your oldest son is getting ready to go to Bible college. Can you believe, can you believe that? And um, I just wanna say to you that um, this church loves you. This church um, is honored to have you. And I'm just so excited because you know what? What's better than a guest speaker, in my opinion, is having the pastor, the angel of the house, speak right to us. So I'm full of faith. I'm excited, and um, City Church, can you show some love to your pastor as she comes to bring the word? second choice, God's first choice. <laughs> no, it's all right. Um, you can be seated. Thank you so much. I feel the love and thank you, Pastor Kent, for that awesome introduction. It was amazing. And, you know, I, I feel like there's something really special about this season. And I was praying about tonight and I was thinking about you and I you know, I ask the Lord all the time, what do you want me to say? Because I can have some thoughts and I can have some topics and I can have some talking points. And it really, it's really God <laughs> readjusting, you know, whatever our thoughts are to match his thoughts. And it's so important when we're praying for God to speak to us or for God to move in our life is that we align ourselves with who God is in his spirit and say, God, I have this want, I have this need, I have this plan, I have this agenda, but nevertheless, 
not my will be done, but your will be done. And so I really feel like tonight is going to be something special. And, you know, I'm, I'm full of faith. I'm fired up. I mean, we could have ended the service <laughs> right after that last worship song. And then Pastor Kent did an amazing message that encouraged us. And, you know, we could have ended it right there. But 50 people are getting water baptized tonight. I'm not going to be long-winded. But God is doing something special in this season. And I want to encourage you out of the Bible in Joel chapter 2. It says, and afterward, somebody say afterward. afterward. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Somebody say sons. sons. Somebody say daughters. daughters. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, I really believe that God is restoring right now what's out of order within our world. Between men and women, God is making what was wrong right. And the enemy is such a liar, and I know this isn't a city chick's message, but it is a precursor to what I'm going to talk about. But the enemy is such a liar because he had women believing. He had women believing that they were some subservient beta prototype and that they didn't have a place at the table. But yet when God created the earth, he created first Adam and then Eve. And then he breathed his spirit into them both. He breathed his life into them, the alpha and the omega. And we represent the image of God. We represent who he is. And I love that it's the alpha and the omega. But yet the woman was the one who would carry the seed that would break the serpent's neck. And so the enemy has always had it out for women since the beginning of time. If he could just break the carrier, then he knows that the seed wouldn't come forth. But I'm here to say that the Lord has redeemed what the enemy has set out to destroy. God is making right in this season. And it is not women against men and women against women, because where does it leave women? If women hate men and women are in competition with each other, who do they have? He would keep them silent. But yet there's a place, there's an order for men and women. Man, I love the beautiful creation and the picture, the complete picture. When women are confident in who they are and that the men are confident in who they are and that we're not in competition, but yet we stand next to each other. The man is the head of the household. The woman carries the heart. And therefore, I can walk in a different grace. You can walk in a different grace. And it can be a complete picture. And the Lord is making right what the enemy has tried to make wrong. For so long, women are getting their confidence back. And it's not going to be a season of feminists. It's a beautiful, effeminate picture of a woman walking in grace alongside her husband. And they both do different things, yet they were created equal in the sight of God. And when we walk in our grace, we serve a complete picture of the image of God. And so I just want you to receive that today. If you need healing, if you need healing in that area in your life, I want you to receive that right now. God is turning it around. Man, for his glory, for our goodness. All right. Now Genesis 37, that wasn't even my message. I just felt led to say that. Genesis 37, 3 through 5, it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his sons because he was born to him later in life, and he made a special tunic for him. And when Joseph's brother saw that their father loved him more than them, they hated Joseph 
and were not able to speak to him kindly. Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more. Verse 37, 23, when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, the special tunic that he wore. They took him and they threw him into the cistern. And when they sat down to eat their food, they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying spices, balm, and myrrh down to Egypt. And then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and cover up the blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, but let's not lay a hand on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchant passed by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him into the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And then the Ishmaelites took Joseph to Egypt. It's interesting. The brothers hated the favor that was on Joseph's life. Joseph, in his immaturity, spoke about a dream that he was given, and it caused his brothers to hate him even more. God sometimes will give you dreams and visions, but yet it's not time to speak them. And sometimes in our immaturity, we can even reveal too soon that it causes others to be jealous, to hate, to discourage the dream. So when you are dreaming and when you are seeing things in pictures, pray about when you're to speak about what you see and what you dream. And so there was favor on Joseph's life, and he wore a great tunic. Most people know Joseph as the technicolor coat, or you're familiar with the story, you know, as a, as a boy who had favor on his life. But really, Joseph just wanted to fit in with his brothers. Joseph didn't ask to be different. He didn't ask to have favor on his life. He just desired to be where his brothers were. See, favor will cause you to stand out when all you want to do is fit in. Favor will have you trying to fit in, but you were born to stand out. And the reality is, is each one of you carry favor on your life. And if you're not careful, that favor will allow you to think this, th listen to this, that favor will allow you to think that people, God is against you because favor doesn't look like favor when it's marked by God. Favor often looks like betrayal, abandonment, being sold out, discouraged, opposed. And so it, it, it seems odd, doesn't it, that the ones that God favors would experience so much heartbreak and heartache, yet they are accomplishing a greater purpose. And so when you have favor on your life, others will notice it, and they'll be mad at you for no reason. You'll walk into work, and they won't like you from the jump. And you don't know why they don't like you. You don't know why people rear up at the sight or the thought of you, but maybe there is something on your life that's different and they can't help but notice when you try to fit in, when you just try to blend in, when you're just trying to be nice, when you're just trying to serve, when you're just trying to be there for your family, when you're just trying to be a good employee at work, it causes others to hate what God has marked. But don't get discouraged because God has favored you. He set you apart for a specific assignment. And when you're favored, you can't help but stand out. Let's pray here tonight. Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for your word, for it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're doing in this room tonight. I thank you for what you've already done. God, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence. God, I'm asking you, Lord, that you would be with me as I speak. God, that you would recalculate every single word. 
to be your word, my thoughts to be your thoughts. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are breathing out faith in this room. God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are healing those that are hurt today in this room. God, I thank you, Lord, that you are encouraging us. God, that you are building our faith for what's ahead of us. So, Father, we give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Somebody say, favor ain't fair. Favor ain't fair. Have you ever had anyone close to you sell you out? And then stand by to watch you suffer? How is it that Joseph's brothers would throw him into a pit and then sit down and eat lunch? You know, betrayal doesn't happen from those you don't know. Betrayal happens because of those you do know. And often it's family or those closest to us. And yet they can sit down, have, have a bite to eat, and watch you suffer. And see, favor will mark you. Favor will mark you for suffering. Favor will cause you to be in seasons of pits and seasons of the palace, seasons of prison, seasons of accusation. And the, the life of favor doesn't look like a life of favor. It looks like a life of destruction, but you're going to need faith for the favor that's on your life. Can God trust you with the pain that others cost you? When you have a choice to be vindicated or a choice to extend grace, because that's the difference in how far you will go in life. Because if the purpose was just for you, and the favor was just for you, then you would be able to decide the path to which you were going to take. You would be able to decide how you would use the favor that's upon your life. But when your favor on your life is for God's purposes, there's something greater than what you have in mind. And see, for Joseph, God was using his life to preserve a nation, the nation of Israel. How does a Hebrew get to the position of prime minister in Egypt, only God, only through suffering. Yet God knew he could trust him with the pain that he experienced. Can God trust you with the pain that you experienced, with the betrayal that you experienced, with the abandonment that you experienced in your life? Or are you going to be stuck in that season and go backward where God wants to push you forward because one day you're going to stand amongst those that betrayed you, amongst those that left you, amongst those that talked about you, amongst those that are not for you and you're going to have a decision to make am I going to look at the pain or I'm going to remember the dream are you going to remember the dream see God's given you a dream but see the enemy knows that that dream is so big and he knows the assignment on your life is so big that he's going to use everything he can to discourage you and to get you to think that you're going backward, not forward, because favor doesn't look like promotion. Favor looks like you're going backwards. How does somebody get thrown into a pit and elevate to prime minister, to be in the highest position in the land? How does that happen? How do you look at your brothers that sold you into slavery, that left you for dead, and look at them and remember the dream and reconcile? and cry tears of joy. It's only because you don't remember the pain or you choose not to focus on the pain, but you choose to focus on the promise, on the dream. And so many of you are here tonight and God is needing to increase your faith. He's needing you to remember the vision, to remember the stories, to not worry so much, but to wonder more, to marvel at his goodness, to marvel at who he is, and not at the pain or the betrayal behind you or the rejection, because rejection will hold you back. Rejection breeds rejection. There is no promotion in rejection. And Joseph's response to life's pain would determine how far he would go. 
And the same question is for us. We face in life. Is our response going to be to the pain or to the dream? Because when we think about favor, we can get discouraged because we think about prosperity, blessing. Favor ain't fair. Privilege. Marked by God. Money. Success. How would you ever think that favor would look like betrayal, accusation, abandonment, or being sold out? If you look at the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus, they are filled with this reality. Isaiah 53.3 says he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, and he was familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. Matthew 21.42, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone, and this is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful to see. Jesus was despised and rejected, yet appointed and loved by God. He said, in this life, you will have trouble, but take heart. I'm with you. I have overcome. Just because you're a Christian and you follow me doesn't mean that you won't face any trials that you won't face any hardships. And what we believe is, God, if you were really for me, God, if this was really the path that I'm supposed to be on, there shouldn't be pits. There shouldn't be bumps. God, I shouldn't have to endure this pain. Lord, I shouldn't have to. And we can convince ourselves that God isn't with us, that he's abandoned us, that we're not marked, that we're not going in the right direction because it's not going perfectly or because we are facing hardships. But we can be encouraged to look at the word of God and look at who he used and to look at the life of Esther and how he used her, preserved her to save a nation and how he used Joseph amongst the pain, even in the trials that he faced, even though he was, you know, wielded out from his family, even though he was in the pit, even though he was sold out, to a prison, even though he was accused. Yet God still used him because he chose. You have a choice. You have a choice to be hurt. You have a choice to remember the betrayal or to remember the dream. See, the crowd is fickle. If you live by the applause of man, you'll die by the criticism of You can't build your life on what other people think. You can't build your life in just what you see in every single season. It causes us to be fickle. It causes us to be swayed. We have to know, come hell or high water, I'm in this. God's called me. God's favored me. God's chosen me. God has a plan for my life. You have to start speaking to your future faith is speaking to the things that have not been revealed, that you have to believe that God is working even though you don't know how he's working. And we won't move. You're waiting for the proof, and God is waiting for you to move. Move your feet. I need proof that you're going to heal me before I declare that I'm healed. I need proof that you're going to do it for me, that you're going to provide for me, God, that you're going to give me the promotion. I need proof. And God is saying, I am the proof. I need you to move your feet. I need you to put your faith in action. You need faith for the favor that's on your life. You need the increased faith in your life to move in the direction that God is calling you to move. Every blessing comes with crushing. We look for God often to bless what we are doing instead of asking him what he wants us to do. And when life serves us pain, we get stuck in that season or make it our cycle if we don't allow the Lord to heal it. If we only see our life as our own purpose, then we limit God's ability to use us. We don't free ourselves up to be used by God. And we say it all the time. I love Pastor Micah said it last week, talking about, you know, being available 
and looking up from scrolling every two minutes and be like, God, I'm available. <laughs> we say, God, we want to be used. But in order for something to be used, it has to be available. So your availability to God is speaking. It plays out how God decides to use you. So there are a few things in the life of Joseph that we can pull out that will help us to increase our faith. And I just want to hit on three of them. But I'm so excited for all the baptisms, and we're going to go into baptisms in just a few minutes. So if I could just have the keys come up behind me. I, want to, I just want to address three things, three ways to increase your faith. Number one is to allow God to heal your rejection. And when Joseph saw his brothers, he remembered the dream. Everyone loves to hear man's rejection, God's protection, but it stings. And to pretend like it's not real is to be blind. But Joseph could not allow bitterness to take root in his heart. And he would have to set in in every single season, whether he was in the prison, being forgotten after he interpreted dreams. He was forgotten. He had to recall the dream because rejection breeds rejection. And the lie that the enemy will tell us is if we isolate and we live our life in a way that no one has the power to hurt me anymore, wow. we will live a life alone, isolated, and we won't fulfill the purpose that God has placed on our life. I wonder how many people are in that place because of rejection, because of a season where somebody left you, somebody talked about you, somebody betrayed you, and you felt abandoned in a pit. And you're in this place where you're never going to let anyone ever take advantage of you. You're never going to let anybody else come into your life that has the ability to hurt you. What God is saying is give that rejection to me. Let me heal you. Because you won't accomplish the plan and the purpose. You won't remember the dream if you live in a place of rejection. He wants to keep you bound with the spirit of rejection and you believing you're the only one that deals with it. But I think if I asked every single person in this room if they've ever been rejected at some point in their life, I think every hand would be up. So why is it that the enemy has you convinced that you're the only one? And then you start to recycle and rehearse a script and project onto people what they're thinking about you. And you have disqualified a relationship before you've even spoken to somebody out of a fear of rejection. And so you're limiting God's blessing in your life, relationships in your life, because you've rehearsed a script that isn't even true. And you've started to try to project an outcome before you even entered into one conversation. And so God wants to take that hurt and that pain and heal it because it will limit you in life to what you're able to do and what you're able to accomplish. It's hard to give Jesus your yes when you're trying just to keep the peace. A spirit of rejection will make you second guess yourself at anything you attempt to do. We want reassurance before we step out to do anything. We want to know the outcome before we decide to take a leap of faith. But that gap is where God does the supernatural work. And he can't show up for you and increase your faith if there's no gap, if there's no spot for him to do his work. He asks you to do your part, which is to step out in faith and believe him at his word and then watch what he does. But oftentimes we try to do our work in his work and we only do enough work where we're just okay with minimal risks. But you weren't born to arrive at death safely. Yeah. 
I was really just trying to condense my message because I know we got to, so I'm trying to fit in what I feel like. And this is a rest, right? So it's like, God, whatever you want to say. And I know it doesn't look like it normally looks, but I'm being obedient. And I'm just going to allow the Lord to say what he wants to say. Because I believe that God is working different in this season. And I don't want to stifle what he wants to get to you. So if I have a projection of what I think you need to hear and I start to filter based on your response, guess what? I'm going to limit the word of God. So guess what? I'm just, God, say what you want to say. I believe he wants to heal some people of the spirit of rejection because it's holding you back. It's keeping you small. You know that you're walking in a spirit of rejection when your yes is compromised by second guessing yourself, by second guessing others, by attempting to control an outcome, by living within a fixed mindset, and you can't celebrate anyone else around you because your success is related to how well or how bad they're doing. Rejection will keep you over projecting. We falsely project onto others what we assume they are thinking, depending on whatever we're thinking or feeling. But you need to fixate on Jesus, fix your eyes back on him and remember the dream. Joseph did not live by worry, but by wonder. You can't live in both spaces. So you have to either choose to live by worry or by wonder. And there's so much that the culture world is throwing at you that gets you worried and anxious. But the Bible says not to worry about anything or be anxious about anything, but in all things, give thanks and pray about everything. And then the peace of God will be on your life. And so we're, we're commanded not to worry about anything. So we can walk in favor, we can walk in purpose, we can walk in confidence when we choose to give God our rejection and not to live by worry but by wonder. Well, what if he doesn't do it? But what if he does? Well, what if he doesn't heal me? But what if he does? Are you even giving God an opportunity to show up? Or are you factoring him out? God's silence is not his absence. Our trust is not yielded in the places that are easy and set up and perfect for us. It's in those places where you're not hearing God speak. It's in those hardships. It's in the pit. It's in the prison. It's not in the palace. I can trust him in the palace. I can trust God at when I'm at my best, but am I going to trust God when I'm at my worst? Am I going to trust God when I don't hear anything? And am I going to believe him at his word that even though in the natural, everything looks like it's falling apart, that God is yielding and working out a different narrative in the supernatural that I can't see. And I have to believe that God is working all things that the enemy meant for bad, for my good, for his purpose. You have to believe. That despite what you see, God is working on your behalf. That he's setting you up. That he's setting you apart for promotion and for favor. But he wants to know, can he trust you with the pain? At every point, Joseph passed the test. Proverbs 29, 25 says, Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. We got to give God our rejection. Number two, allow Jesus to fix your ear gate and your eye gate. Remember that song? Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. If you only hear through your hurt, you will never hear what Jesus is trying to say. And if you only choose to see through squinty eyes, skeptical eyes, you will miss the wonders that he's placed right in front of you. To increase your faith, you have to put down the worldly filter and put on the kingdom glasses. 
And how do we live a life of faith when we're constantly worried or filtering things through the world's filter? How do we believe for healing when we're asking for proof before the miracle? I remember getting an email actually a, long, a couple of years ago when Pastor Kent was doing the Nehemiah series. And uh, I remember him talking about Nehemiah rebuilding the wall. In fact, in fact, Pastor Micah did it last week, talked about rebuilding the wall. And we got an email about cultural appropriation and talking about the wall and the border. And we're, we're, we're reading a Bible story. But people will hear and miss out on what God is trying to tell them because they're anxious about the projection of what they're hearing and what are they saying and are they using this to talk about the border crisis and are they saying they're for immigration or against it? Maybe God is just trying to speak his word to you. Maybe his word is his word. And maybe if we just took off the worldly filters from our eyes and from our ears and took him at his word that we would encounter blessing and healing but i wonder how many of us are missing the blessing and the healing and the words that god is trying to get to you just because of how we're filtering what we hear and what we see and we choose to agree with how the world sees things and we're not looking to the word of god and then when the word of god is spoken now it's even looked through in certain lenses and certain ear gates yeah. And God is wanting to restore your ear gate and your eye gate. And he's saying, fix your eyes on me. Don't fixate on what the world has in front of you because my kingdom is different than this world's way of working. And I want to get something to you, but you're filtering it through the wrong lens and the wrong way of hearing. You're hearing through your hurt. And I want to, I want to heal that hurt. The Lord is wanting to heal your hurt so that you can hear differently. What would that look like for you? That means when you're having a conversation with somebody, you're not defensive about a trigger they didn't know they pulled. Stepped on that. That's triggering me. God wants to heal your triggers. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Listen, y'all, I want to be free and as free as I can. So, Lord, heal my triggers because I know I got a lot of them. I got a lot of buttons. And listen, you might be feeling like somebody's stepping on buttons and you kind of like the button. It's kind of comfortable. Oh, you hit that button. You know what? I don't have to talk to you. God wants to heal that. What would your life look like if you didn't have the buttons, if you didn't have the triggers, if God did a miracle for you emotionally? Because he can do it. Because God is so good. Because Jesus died and took stripes on his back. Not that you could just be okay. Not that you could just be healed physically, but that you could be healed emotionally. That means your soul, even though bad things happen to you, you don't have to live like it. You can go through the fire and not smell like smoke. You can go through trials. God is for you. He is not against you. The enemy is against you. And you think that by holding on to a button or a trigger that you are going to have one up. Jesus. That you're in control. But really you're bound. You're bound and you're not free. And the Lord wants to set you free tonight. What kind of trigger, what kind of button do you need to give to the Lord tonight? Wow. He wants to heal it. Christ came that you may be set free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Woo, Lord Jesus. Listen, I'm preaching to myself. There's so much that God can do if we just surrender our life to him fully. That means every single space of our heart. You're like, I'll, I'll let you work on three-fourths of it. But this quarter... It's mine. You got to just take the filter off. Hang it up on your worry tree. That's what I said. Come in with a burden. Just 
hang it up. You can pick it up afterwards. What if you heard the message for yourself and not for other people? Oh, so-and-so needs to hear this. You need to hear it. I'm going to send this. But what if God is talking to you? And so even when we hear messages, we're like, it's about so-and-so. <laughs> and then we miss because we're hearing even, what is God trying to get to you? Don't miss it. And listen, and then you can be anxious and all worried and mad and to hear through the filters after the service. But man, how great is it? How freeing. Oh, man, this is just this life because it's God's word. Matthew 13 a few a few verses I know I'm closing babe I'm just trying to do my third closing like you do I'm trying to um, let's go okay no no I know he's just messing up the order tonight then he told them many things in this parable this is Jesus talking a farmer went out to sow a seed and as he was scattering the seed some fell along the path and the birds came up and ate it up Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they were withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns where it grew up and choked the plants. Still the other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, 160 or 30 times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. The disciples asked, they came up to him and said, why do you speak to people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will to be given more, he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and they would turn an eye would heal them. Triggers. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And to hear what you hear, but they did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, The evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in the heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth chokes it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop from it, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. I love this. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and they would turn, and I would heal them. When Joseph found himself in prison and being falsely accused, he found favor with the warden. In fact, four times throughout the life of Joseph, it says that God was with Joseph, and he found favor with the Lord, and everything was blessed because of him. Favor will follow you 
when you choose to see God's sovereignty in everything around you. And when you choose to listen to the voice of Jesus instead of the voice of others. Which leads me to number three on my final close. Prayerfully choose those you align yourself with. Joseph's brothers fed off of each other. The collective voice of envy and jealousy plotted for their brother's harm. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. How come it doesn't say that good character infiltrates bad company? You are the total, they say, of the five the sum total of the five closest people to you. We have to be a lot more selective with who gets our ear. Who are you aligning yourself with? When Jesus went into the house of Jairus, he went in to heal his daughter. And when he was on his way, the servant ran out and says, don't bother Jesus, your daughter is dead. So Jesus walks in, and at that time they would hire flute players and weepers when people would die. There were weepers. There were people crying for the death of Jairus' daughter inside the house. And when they walked in and Jesus says, here's Jesus, the miracle worker. He's already got proof. He's in person healing people along the way. And yet he walks in and the women that are there, they look at him and they mock him. The Bible says that they laugh at him when he says, she's not dead, she only sleeps. And Jesus' response to mockers, to people laughing in disbelief, is get out. So it says that Jesus said to get out at once because he cannot do miracles in the midst of disbelief. And when you align yourself with mockers and people that mock the things that you're believing for, you got to tell them to get out of my house. I love you, but you can't be right here. Because I need God to do a miracle. I'm believing for Jesus to heal me, but your negativity is costing me. And so you have to be careful with who you align yourself with. That doesn't mean that you don't have to be nice to everyone, but that does mean we have to be more selective with who we allow speaking into our life. And too often we allow those that just impede in our life and they start being negative and they start dwindling our faith down and causing us to shrink back and trying to muzzle the words of faith. Yet God is saying today, Jesus is saying, stand up, receive your healing, get your hand off the button, allow God to do the supernatural work, allow him to heal you of the rejection that you face because I have favor on you. I have purpose on your life and you can't do it in the current place that you're in, but you got to kick some people out. you stand with me here tonight? I just want to pray for you. We could have the worship team. We're going to close with a song, and then we're going to be dismissed. Pastor Kent's going to come back up. Would you uh, close your eyes and bow your heads? If you're here tonight in any part of this message resonated with you, And you're just saying, you know what? I'm tired of carrying this. I'm tired of trying to make it all work. I want to surrender this hurt, this rejection to Jesus. I need a miracle. Or maybe you're here tonight and you just say, hey, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Pastor Kent prayed it earlier. If that's you here tonight, I want to pray for you. Would you just lift one hand up? You just need healing. You need emotional healing. Jesus means strength. I believe God's going to do a miracle tonight. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So Father, I thank you, Jesus. And I thank you that you're the great miracle worker. There's not one thing that you can't do. And God, we have humbly come before you tonight. And we have in our vulnerability lifted our hands. Uh, We're asking you for healing. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, I just release healing in this place. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that the weight, the emotional weight is being lifted right now. I rebuke 
the power of the enemy and say, you have no authority in this place. I thank you, Jesus, that your promises are yes and amen for our life. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the healing that you're distributing across this place. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that right now hearts are being put back together. The broken pieces are being put back together. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that our soul, God, is not going to be weary in this season, but we're gonna be charged up with faith for the favor that's on our life. I thank you for favor. Father, I thank you that you are with us. And God, I thank you, Lord, that you're working for us on our behalf. So Jesus, continue to do what you always do. That is to save and to heal and to redeem that which was lost. Holy Spirit, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to worship a little bit, and then um, we're going to be dismissing in just a few minutes. But why don't we let the Holy Spirit seal this message with worship? Fear is not my future. You are, you are. Sickness is not my story. You are, you are. Hope is not my hope. You are.
Really quick, if we could honor all of those that are going to be water baptized right now. Um, the best way that we can do that um, is by we're going to let them kind of head out first. So Sarah Wheeler, our ministry director, is up there. And then Vince is, uh, Vince is right over here. And so they're going to lead you uh, to the restrooms, and then we're going to be in the lower theater. How many of you have never been to the lower theater, right? So it's just in the lobby, and uh, we go down. But listen, we're going we're gonna to continue to worship, but we need to let them go get changed. It's going to take about 10 to 15 minutes or so. But just really quick, just by a show of hands, how many of you are getting water baptized tonight? Awesome. We celebrate. Would you guys grab all your stuff and then uh, head up to Vince and Sarah? They're going to lead you to um, the, the, the place where you're going to get changed. Come on, let's cheer them on as they go. And we're going to meet them in just a few moments in the lower theater. And if you're here tonight and you just feel led uh, and you want to get water baptized, I'm sure we can find some clothes for you. Why don't you just jump out the aisle and, and uh, follow everyone out and um come on let's give pastor Allie a great big hand wasn't that incredible and um that's exactly why she's my favorite it's so powerful practical how many of you say that's for me tonight that message was for me tonight that was so good thank you so much can we just sing again can we just um let's just worship a little bit more um Let's just sing a little bit more, and then we're going to, in just a minute, we're going to dismiss. We're going to dismiss to go downstairs, and we're going to cram in the lower theater. We're going to celebrate all of those that are being water baptized. But come on, let's continue to worship and celebrate uh, what God has done and is doing, even now, in this moment. Amen?
celebrate all that God is doing. Um, how many of you have friends that are being baptized tonight? Um, let's go down there and listen, if you're a, if you call City Church home, this is a, this is a family moment and I want to encourage you to just be there for your spiritual family and uh, these are always uh, incredible times uh, and memories and highlights uh, for our church. So um, we have Easter this Sunday, 8:30. 10, 11, 30, and 1. Make sure to RSVP. Uh, we don't want you coming, you know, um, in your Easter best and then getting placed in the worst seat, right? Um, so we want to make sure everyone has an incredible seat. So RSVP, it helps us serve you better. Um, but we love you. It's Holy Week. Jesus is on the move. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'll be in the lower theater. Let's just work our way there. And it's on through the lobby. If you don't know where it is, just ask. Uh, ask. Our leaders will help you. Or just follow the crowd uh, down to the lower theater. 